Um, so it's definitely a, a great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, an announcement, so part of my talk is about our work on Zimmer's conjecture. And next fall, this week in October, there's an Arbeitsgemeinschaft in Oberwolfach on this. So this is the seminar where you learn by doing. So it's for non-experts, so in particular students and postdocs who want to learn some of the tools that we use. And you give all the lectures, and we sit in the back and we heckle you. Um, so there's a deadline at the end of the month to apply. And my understanding is that so they want about 50 people, and they don't have money for travel expenses necessarily. Some They might be some for, for US participants, but once you get there, they cover everything. And I've never been to one of these, but I've heard they're, they're nice. And I'm organizing this one, so hopefully this one will be nice. Uh, OK, so that was my announcement. Um, and so for my talk, uh, so I never officially met Marina. Um, in winter 2008, I gave a talk at Berkeley on early version of, of this material. And there was someone in the audience who I didn't recognize. And it was only afterwards that someone told me that was, that was Marina in the audience. And so I was very honored she came to my talk, but disappointed I didn't actually get to meet her in, in person. And then she passed away a few months later. So that was my only in-person experience with her. I remember she asked a couple of good questions. but. Uh, and so I, I come from the world of, of hyperbolic dynamics or semi-simple actions. So I'm not going to have polynomial divergence. I'm going to have exponential divergence. But uh, I'm coming from the world of higher rank hyperbolic dynamics. And at least philosophically, OK, there's experts in the room. But philosophically, higher rank hyperbolic dynamics, you're supposed to be able to mimic a lot of tools that you can do in unipotent dynamics, in, in polynomial divergence. So that's what, that's what my, my talk's about. Um, maybe before I actually talk about my results, I'll, I want to say two results of, of Marina Ratner that I think one really does motivate what I'm, what I'm talking about, and one maybe is just by analogy. So the first result, maybe I'll take G a semi-simple Lie group and gamma lattice. So a lattice subgroup in G. And let's just suppose that we have SL2R or maybe PSL2R or some finite cover embedding into G. And this is the, the result I'm going to state is sort of buried as a proposition in, in the middle of the of the the work on on measure rigidity, but it, it's a it's a proposition I really like. So this is the theorem, and it's the following. Oh, I need one more definition. So inside of SL two R, there's a there's a subgroup which I'll call P prime, and it's the subgroup of upper triangular matrices. So not unipotent, not the one parameter, but this two parameter solvable group. So here's the theorem is that every p, I guess I call it p prime, invariant probability on g mod gamma is automatically SL2R invariant. And it doesn't matter which, what SL2R it was you had embedded in here. So the, the way this usually appears is you have a particular unipotent you want, you find something that you call the diagonal for it, and then well, either the measure's p prime invariant, in which case it's SL2R invariant, or it's not, and you shoot up, you have, you have the U invariant measure drifts into the cusp. If anyone knows, the, knows where this is popping up in, in, in the context of her work. Um, so, so I like this, and we actually quote this in, our, in some of our work, this particular proposition. But uh, another reason to bring this up is that, so we've seen that maybe you know, looking at unipotent flows makes sense in homogeneous dynamics, but maybe not so much in non-homogeneous settings, which I think is the, the context perhaps of Barak's talk, is that you know, <coughs> unipotent behavior is strange in some non-homogeneous settings. So perhaps maybe this is, the, this, is a, this is a question or something philosophical. Is this the correct formulation of 
Ratner type theorems in in homogeneous settings is that rather than looking at you know, u-invariant measures, you look at p-invariant measures, and first you try to show that they're SL2R invariant, and then maybe say they're actually homogeneous in some sense. And this really is the context of Alex Eskin's talk and the Benoit Quant work, work that has been discussed, and the eskin mirz Akani work is just studying p-invariant measures on some nice space or something that looks a lot like a p. And then you really want to show that they're SL2R invariant, and then show more properties of them. Okay, so that's the first, first result I wanted to bring up. The second result uh, Federico alluded to in his talk. So let me look specifically at H now is equal to SL2R. And I have gamma 1, gamma 2. These are two different lattices. And I have M1. I have what do I have? I have MI is the, the Haar volume form on H mod gamma I. And so what I want to look at is what are the possible joinings for the unipotent flow on, this, on, on these two things. So the question is the possible joinings. Join, joinings. And I guess I should say here, I am going to look at the unipotent flow. So this is one T01, and this is acting on H mod gamma I MI. So what are the possible joinings of these two systems that have the same, the same thing here? And I won't say it. So, so of course, there's some obvious joinings here. Uh, maybe I should remind you what a joining is. So IE, we want a diagonally invariant probability. So UT cross UT invariant mu on some total space, which is just the product. So H mod gamma I cross, I don't have a parenthesis there, mod gamma 1, H mod gamma 2. So we want a invariant, diagonally invariant measure up here with the right marginals, so such that uh, I have X, I have a projection onto H mod gamma 2, a projection onto H mod gamma 1, I have mu living here, and I want this to be M2 here, and I want this to be M1 here. All right, so this is what I mean by a joining. And there's an obvious joining, which is you take mu to be the product. And if this is the only possible joining, you say that the two systems are disjoint. There's another sort of obvious one that happens, but you require some extra things. So if uh, gamma 1 is actually equal to gamma 2, then you have the same base system and the same, the same, yes? You want a diagonal duty action, right? Not duty cross duty invariant. But diagonal duty invariant, right? T stay. So it's the same T. T. Third half is T. So it's, if you write a comma, <laughs> okay. a pair with a comma. Then. Pair it with a comma. Okay. <laughs> you like this better, okay. It's not a, a multi-parameter action, yeah. <laughs> Whatever the diagonal action is. Okay, and if, these, if, these two, if the two base systems are the same, the flows are the same, there's another joining you can put which is sitting on the diagonal. So there's the diagonal joining. And you can do more general things if one is a factor of the other than just sitting on the graph of the factor, there's another joining. And so, uh, so can I, can I erase my announcement? <laughs> if you're interested, you can apply, but do it before the, the end of the month. So for, for this case, and this is, this is really, spit, uh, my understanding is it's special to SL2R because it really uses the, the Ratner property, which is a little bit more general, a little more specific than general unipotent dynamics, is that theorem, Ratner, and, and she shows that uh, either the only joining, <coughs> joining 
is mu equals m1 cross m2, so the two systems are disjoint, or there's some sort of rigidity, and well, there's some rigidity if they're the same, and basically she concludes that they're more or less the same. So gamma 1 is commensurable to some conjugate of gamma 2, and in which case you have that, you have joinings on some sort of generalized diagonals. Hmm? Oh, yes, they are conjugate. The only ergodic, well, the only ergodic, yes. And I'm going to forget to say the word ergodic many times today. So, um, so, so I, I like the spirit of this theorem, which is that, well, there's, there's an obvious way to join two systems, or, well, the old, if there's a non-obvious way to join them, that's because there's some really strong relationship between them. And I'll try to cast one of, our, one of the theorems I present in this, in this light, although maybe it's only by analogy. Um, there's a corollary which she actually proved earlier, which Federico mentioned this morning, but you can derive it from this, which is that every measurable factor of the UT flow on, on H mod gamma is in fact an algebraic factor. And of course, the measurable factor gives you a different joining. Okay, so then let me actually get to the setting of, of what I want to talk about. And so I want to talk about actions of discrete groups or actions of lattices, but I'm going to sort of get there in a backwards way. going to give a bunch of definitions. So throughout G is going to be a simple Lie group. Um, in general, to avoid technicalities and stating conjectures or theorems, I'm going to always assume that it's R split, whatever that means. And I'm also going to assume that it's higher rank, which I will define in a minute. And if that's too fancy, just take at G equals S L N R and N is at least three. And gamma is a lattice subgroup in G. And so of course, if you like, S L N Z works. And uh, just a couple other definitions. G has a Iwasawa decomposition, K A N. And so here, K is S O N, A is the positive diagonal matrices. So the group of diagonal matrices, so for the form E to the T1, E to the TN, and N is strictly upper triangular. So matrices of this form. And just the dimension of A is what we call the rank. So A is the maximal uh, add R diagonalizable abelian group. And so over here, the rank is the dimension of this A, which is N minus 1, which is why we have N at least 3 here. Uh, L is going to be the centralizer in K of A. And so over here, L is just a finite group. It's the diagonal matrices with plus or minus ones on them. And then finally, P is L, A, N is what's called a minimal parabolic subgroup. And let me give you a couple of numbers. So I'm not using the R split at all here, but when I actually state some theorems, the R split will be hiding in them. So.
Okay, I don't want to give you numbers yet. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure why I'm doing things in this order, but I'll follow the order I've written down. Um, I want x to be uh, smooth. Is there a question? No. A smooth g equivariant fiber bundle. So it projects down to g mod gamma. So it's a fiber bundle. So there's some compact, smooth manifold that sits in this. And there's a natural g action on x. And that's going to descend to a g action on g mod gamma. And I guess the philosophy is we know a lot of things about the g action down here, or about subgroups of g acting down here. Because this is homogeneous dynamics, and there's a lot of theorems we can say down here. And so maybe the question is, well, can we lift those theorems to what's happening up here? Can we use, can we generalize theorems from homogeneous dynamics to some sort of g equivariant bundle like this? And well, I'm supposed to be talking about lattice actions. And so far, there's a g action on this bundle. And what's the relationship? So if I let E be the identity coset, and let me call this map pi. And if I let M E be pi inverse of E, and if I take x in M E, and if I hit x by an element of the lattice, it comes back to the same fiber. So if x is in here, gamma of x is also in here. And so you obtain, so you get, so this induces a representation of gamma by diffeomorphisms, say, of the fiber through the identity. And I think this is what's called the monodromy. Is that the right word to use? The monodromy of the bundle? Somebody's nodding their heads. OK. So starting with a bundle like this, you build a discrete action. Or starting from a, an action of a lattice, you build a bundle like this. And they're the same objects. So I want to look at things like this today. But really, I want to answer questions about this kind of object. But you go back and forth between the two. So starting with this, you can, of course, build the bundle. And. Oh, I know why I wanted all these definitions over here, because I had to build up to P. So I have this bundle here. Here's a remark. P is amenable, is, um, if I can spell it, amenable. So in particular, the G action on this bundle might not have an invariant measure, but the restriction to the P action definitely has an invariant measure. <laughs> You might worry that the base is non-compact, but you can, that you, can, you can overcome that. So there's definitely p-invariant measures up here. And so here's my, my motivating question. So maybe question one. So when is a? P invariant probability mu on this bundle X automatically going to be G invariant. So following the, that first theorem of, of Ratner, when we had a P, P prime invariant measure, it became SL2R invariant. Well, is there some criterion that we can automatically upgrade P invariant probabilities on this bundle to being G invariant? And there's a remark here. So if I have a p-invariant measure on the bundle, obviously it projects to a p-invariant measure on g mod gamma. And what are the p-invariant measures on g mod gamma? There's not many of them. It has to be the hard measure. So remark is that if mu, so if mu is p-invariant, then its image is har. And so that the actual question that I'll, I'll give an answer to, so maybe this is question one prime, is so working with P is a little bit too complicated for me. So there's a subgroup of P which I like, which is A. So given an A invariant probability, and of course, I mean ergodic here, probability measure mu on X 
And I, I'm going to assume that it has this property such that it projects to Har. So when is mu automatically G invariant? Or at least invariant under some subgroup of G that's much bigger than the A that I started with. So I'll give an answer to this. And then my question two is a little bit un, not so well formed, but I think, I think it's worth thinking about in terms of Ratner's joining theorem. So it's just what are the possible P invariant probability measures? So maybe in the same way, what are the possible joinings between these two systems? Well, I have this base system, G mod gamma, and I don't really have a joining, but I have this fiber dynamics, whatever the monodromy is saying. And somehow classifying the P invariant measures is somehow classifying what the, at least some dynamical properties of what the monodromy can do. And I will tr attempt to give two answers. So if the... Well, all I'm assuming here is that it's an A invariant measure. Well, this is a more specific question. This is, this is saying, when does a P invariant measure have to be G invariant? And here I want to say, well, really, what are the P invariant measures? Not what are their properties, but what are they on the nose? Uh, okay, I, I'm still being, I'm still, it's after lunch, so I'm trying to be light. So. Okay, so if this is small, And, and I'll say what small means in a minute. Well, one of two things has to happen. Either the monodromy alpha is what we'll call sub-exponential, which, because of the, of the constraints we put on the dimension, is actually going to imply that alpha is finite. So there's some monodromy group here. There's some representation of gamma into this di huge diffeomorphism group. Well, either the image is a finite subgroup over here, or this particular representation here is somehow an algebraic object. And the p invariant measure mu has to sit uh, on a diagonal. And so at least in spirit, this is very similar to, to this joinings theorem that, well, there's some obvious reason for there to exist, for there to exist P invariant measures, which is in this case, they're gonna be forced to be G invariant. And the G invariance is gonna actually force a lot of constraints on the alpha. But if this, this thing doesn't happen, there's a very specific reason they don't happen is because we have some algebraic object ha appearing in our, in our monodromy. Okay, so now, let me state some actual theorems with some precise quantifiers. Are there more questions? So this is some kind of meta theorem now? Uh, uh, th th this is my preview for what I'm going, this is my preview, th this is the question, but I don't think it's very well posed, but this is my preview of the actual theorems I will state. But I would like to say that classifying the P invariant measures seems to be you know, related to understanding all the, all the properties of the, of the, the, the alpha, the monodromy. I mean that it's sitting on the graph of some map, at least when you look at it appropriately. So it's sitting on some, something that looks like the graph of a, of a morphism. Okay, so let me actually state some theorems on, on this monodromy or on these, these, sorts of, these sorts of maps. And now I, I think I'd need to give you two numbers. So again, we ha I have my, my subgroup P, which is my, I think it's a minimal parabolic. It's also the minimal amenable subgroup. So this sits inside of G. Q inside of G is, ca is called a parabolic. If maximal amenable, yes, sorry. It's the minimal parabolic, the maximal amenable. So 
uh, a subgroup is called parabolic if, well, a conjugate of it satisfies that it contains P. So I'll just, that's the standard ones contain my standard P. And so here's two numbers. Nu of G is going to be the minimal dimension of G mod Q, where Q ranges over, well, all parabolics, except I don't want the, the silly ones, so proper parabolics. And N of G is going to be the minimal dimension of some real vector space where there's a non-trivial embedding of, of G into GLV. So it's the minimal dimension in which there's a linear representation of G. Another way to say it. If you're playing along and you know more, more details, there's another number which is the minimal dimension of an isometric representation. I'm, I'm ignoring that by assuming things are R-split. So for G equals S, L, N, R, we have that V of G is N minus 1, and N of G is N. And if you would like another example to convince you that I, I read NAP, at least some of it, SP2, N, R, the V, whoops, V of G, I think this is 2n minus 1 here, and the n of g is 2n. So. Yes? Can, can, you, I'm sorry, I did not hear. can you repeat what the restriction is on the representation? You want it to be Just so that's not trivial. Yeah, what do I want? I want non-trivial. I, I put a thing here, but of course, I maybe it has a finite kernel trivial. or something. Okay. But I'll, yeah, but let's have it just be non-trivial. Maybe there's a finite kernel or something silly. So, re and really, the right definition is in terms of the Lie algebra, but I'm bad at drawing math, Frank. Um, I want to emphasize one example of a G mod Q. So, if G is S, L, N, R, the Q that I like that's going to actually realize this is this Q, so one, uh, stars up here, stars here, and zeros, zeros. So it's, it's this guy. The one should be a star. The, star. Yeah, yeah, the, one. the one should be a star. Yes, I can put a star there. And so here G mod Q is the real projective space, which has this dimension here. And just if I have gamma as a subgroup of S, L, and R, there's an obvious action of gamma on G mod Q just by acting on the left. But here, we have a realization of what this is as, as lines in n dimensions. And this is a subgroup of matrices in n dimensions, so those also act on lines. So this action is the, is the natural action on lines. Right, matrices just act on lines, and that's what this action is. And somehow this is the minimal algebraic example of a non-finite non action of, of gamma it happens here. So now I'll, I'll write down some conjectures. But before I do that, let me say G is equal to S, L. But I want to do this in a way that I can keep them. All right, I'm going to write down hypotheses here, and then I'm going to write things there. S, L, N, R, where N is at least 3. Or if you want, G is R split, simple, and higher rank. And gamma is a lattice in, in G. So I think I'm going to try to fit everything here so I can cover it and then uncover it. We'll see, how, see if that goes. So you're supposed to believe that higher rank lattices can only act in algebraic ways. And this is supposed to be the minimal algebraic action happening here. And so the conjecture, which I'll call Zimmer's conjecture, 
and this is what we'll study in in October in, in Oberfulflock. But really, Zimmer really formulated for volume preserving actions, and this is not a volume preserving action. So I'm not really sure who to attribute it to. It's in print first by Farb and Shalin, although there's a lot of work about it in one dimensions much earlier, including by Gies and, and Woody Morris. But it's the following, that if the dimension of my manifold, or the fibers of this bundle, is less than n minus 1, or if you want to do the fancier version, if it's less than this nu of g, or if it's v of g, I don't remember, then every representation of gamma by diffeomorphisms morphisms, I'm not going to be worry about the regularity today, so let's just assume there's C infinity on M actually is finite. That the only possible way to act on a manifold of low dimensions is, well, the image has a huge kernel, sorry, the, the, the action has a huge kernel, and the image is just a finite group over here. Um, and then you ask, well, what happens in this critical dimension? And so here's a conjecture, and I think it's a reasonable conjecture. But I don't know who to attribute it to. Um, it's definitely related to the Margulis intermediate factor theorem, the measurable factor theorem, and its extensions to the continuous factor theorem by Dani. Um, and it you know, makes sense in the context of the Zimmer program, but I'm not sure who to put an attribution to. So if someone wants to give me an attribution, that'd be great. So if the dimension of M is actually at this critical, uh, uh, this critical number, or if it's actually equal to this nu of G. And if M, let's say, is connected to avoid silly things, uh, then and if I have an action of gamma by diffeomorphisms of M. And this is not a finite object. And this is not finite. Then, well, what should we be true? We have an example of that, which is the natural action on, on projective space. And of course, projective space has an equivariant double cover. So then M is a gamma equivariant cover of, of RPN, n minus 1. So this is a covering space, and the covering is in the way that it's actually a gamma equivariant covering. So IE, there's some C infinity surjection that's a covering map from M to RPN minus 1 with the property that pi of alpha of gamma of x is gamma hit pi of x, where gamma hit is the natural action on, on, on lines. So there should be some smooth change of coordinates making this true. OK, so here are some conjectures. I should say a theorem or two. So theorem one. And I should give, give credit to some co-authors. So theorem one is due to myself, uh, uh, David Fisher who's playing hooky, and Sebastian Hurtado. And theorem one says that conjecture one is true. Oh, I didn't number my conjectures. Conjecture one and conjecture two. For any lattice. For any lattice. And so if you look at they're existing papers, so they're the papers that are on the archive and that have been submitted. We've done it for co-compact lattices in 2016, for a specific SLNZ in 20, 2017, and we have the draft but need to polish it for, for general non-uniform lattices. And theorem 2 doesn't exist in print yet, but it hopefully will by the end of the summer. So this is also me and Federico. And, and Jiren Wang. 
which is that, well, conjecture two is true. Is that in this critical dimension, you can actually say, what are the possible manifolds that you can act on in a non-finite way? And what are these actions? They are exactly these projective actions. Okay, so when did I start? 2.15. Okay, so I'm, I'm dawdling. We're all dawdling up here. So I, I want to wave, I don't want to give a ton of details, but I kind of want to wave my hands at maybe why you should believe these things are true. But before I do that, I actually want to address my first question, which is a mechanism for a P measure to be G invariant. So I might cover that back, cover that and come back to it. Part of the questions about, about that board. Here, here I stated things, yeah, here I'm really stating things for SLN. If you want, you can do, you can do the minimal, the minimal projective space. Yeah, if you want, you could do the minimal G mod Q. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm gonna get technical and do one, one object. Mm -hmm. It hasn't appeared yet, yes. I think it will appear in the next 10 minutes. So you, you use it if you do the measure preserving, the volume preserving version of this, but. So I'll ask just a little bit about Lyapunov exponents. And their relationship to maybe P measures. So just going back, I have G acting on this bundle. This projects over G mod gamma in a G equivariant way. I'll call this pi. My fibers are some compact manifold called M. And I'm gonna have F be the kernel of D pi. So this is the this is all the vectors that are tangent to the fibers of this bundle. So this is the the fiber bundle. Or the fiber, the fiber wise tangent bundle. And now inside of G, I have my favorite group, which is called A. And A is a abelian group, and usually it's a higher rank abelian group. And so I can look at A acting on G, and I, uh, acting on G, acting on X. And I can look at mu, an A invariant and ergodic probability. And what I want to do is I want to say something about what, what's happening in the fibers, the vectors tangent to the fibers as seen by this measure. And I want to give some names to those and those will be called fiber-wise the Alpenoff exponents. So let me just, just say what these are. So obviously G preserves, this is a G equivariant subbundle and A preserves that. And so what's true is that at almost every X, you're gonna have a direct sum decomposition into some spaces. And you're going to have some linear functionals. So I think of A as a Rn, so I'll have linear functionals, and I'll decorate them with a subscript of I, a superscript of F, linear functionals to R. These are called the fiber, the Alpenoff exponents. And they have the property that if I take a V in one of these elements of the splitting, and if I take a and A, and I look at how the derivative of translation by X, by tra derivative at X of translation by A n times, what it does to a vector, well, it should grow or shrink that vector, and it's gonna grow or shrink it at an exponential rate exactly given by what this linear functional evaluated at A is. So this is equal to E to the lambda I F of A times the norm of V, well, it's not exactly equal plus times some sub exponential junk. And of course, if you only care about the exponential growth rate, the sub exponential stuff disappears and you exactly get out that the exponential growth rate is given by this linear functional. N should go there because it should be the growth rate of iterating this. Is that the N that you like, don't like? Yeah, but aren't you Well, yes I do, but I actually wanted to formulate it like this. So I take a particular element, I iterate it, I look at the growth of this, and the growth rate is given by this. 
And actually, I do want to do it on spheres, but I don't want to write it down that way. This is take the derivative at the point x. So v is a vector that's tangent to the fiber. It's in one of these elements. So this is the theorem of Osselet. It says that you have this decomposition. Take an element of the diagonal, iterate it n times, take the derivative and see what that does to the vector. Maybe I should just say a, a n hit that. but So it's going to grow or shrink exactly with this exponential rate. And of course, there's another family of objects like this. So if I look at A acting on G mod gamma, uh, I have, well, I have what are called the roots. I don't need to put them in parentheses. So, so the roots are also, I'll think of them as linear functionals from A to R. And they have the same property that the, the, the root spaces so G beta get dilated, dilated by, by E to the beta of A. So it, there's these homogeneous analogs of what's happening in the fiber, or the roots and the corresponding root spaces. And the root tells you exactly how much you get dilated by. The Lyapunov effects exponents tell you how much you get dilated by up to some sub-exponential junk that we don't really care about. Okay, so the question was, what, 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 I introduced an n earlier, so let me give a, give a remark about n. So this is a corollary of Zimmer co-cycle super rigidity. It's the following. So I have this setup where I have mu is a invariant. Let's suppose that I know if that mu is g invariant. And I know that the dimension of the fibers is less than this n of g. So there's no linear representations into something of this dimension, non, no non-trivial. So then, all these fiber-wise Lyapunov exponents have to be, well, they have to be the zero function. Then lambda i f has to be exactly the zero function for all fiber and off exponents. So this is just, if you know Zimmer co-cycle super rigidity, you sort of see where this is coming from. But essentially the Lyapunov exponents for this, for this action have to be coming from representations, weights of a representation of G, and there's no way to have a representation in this low dimension. M is, M is the, is the fiber. Yeah, so. I still have my fiber bundle structure. Or it's the dimension of the, the fiber F. Uh, okay, this was, this was bad planning. but So I have linear functionals called beta, which are the roots. I have linear functionals called lambda, which are, which are the Lyapunov exponents. And so here's a definition. We'll say that a root beta, which is a function from A to R, is resonant, resonant if, and actually I'm going to define what it means to be non-resonant if as a function from A to R is not positively proportional to any of my fiber behavior, any of my fiber exponential growth rates. <coughs> so there's a bunch of linear functionals controlling what happens in the fiber. There's a bunch of linear functionals just coming from the homogeneous structure. And some of them are positive proportional, some of them are not. So the ones that aren't, we'll just say those are the non-resonant. And here's what I'll call theorem three, which is an unpublished but still pretty old paper of me and Federico and Jiren, which is the following. So let mu be A invariant ergodic 
on x, and we'll put the extra assumption that it projects to the Haar measure. So x projects to g mod gamma, and I want to assume that its image is the Haar measure. So then, for any non-resonant root beta, mu is automatically u beta invariant. And what is u beta? So to every root, there's a root space. And I'm assuming r simple, so there's no double roots. So then every root space has a corresponding unipotent group. And this measure is automatically invariant under this corresponding unipotent subgroup. So I won't say, I'll say out loud a little bit about the proof of this. So we proved this through entropy. And so it's similar to the, to the end game of margulis tomanoffs proof of the, the, of the measure classification theorem. And in spirit, it's really, or maybe even technical details, it's really close to the high entropy method. Uh, but let me say some corollaries of this. So I have some corollaries to write down. So here's a corollary. So this is, you can derive from this result a, a fact that you could also derive from work of Avila Viana which is that if all the fiber exponents were zero, well, then none of the roots are resonant, then mu is G invariant. And of course, I'm assuming the same hypothesis, that it projects to the Haar measure on G mod gamma. So I have an A invariant measure projecting to the Haar measure. If all the fiber exponents are zero, then, then it has to be G invariant. Um, corollary two, is just another counting argument. So if the dimension of the fiber is less than this V of G, then there's just not enough fiber exponents to have a proper group. To, so there's just too many non-resonant. So then mu is automatically G invariant. And the, 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 zero, uh, is the zero function. Yeah, is it non resonant or resonant? It is not resonant because it needs to be positively proportional. So not non negatively, yes. And just the corollary three, which answers my first question. So if the dimension of M is below this critical threshold, every P invariant mu on X is automatically G invariant. So at least on some dimension counting questions, somehow, no matter what P invariant measure you get, they're, they're always gonna be G invariant. Okay, so uh, do I, I take the full hour, is that how it goes? Beeman's in charge? Okay, so I have 10 minutes? Okay. So maybe questions about these three boards? So every P measure is going to be A invariant, and it's automatically going to project to Har. And so we're back up here. And here, this is just a counting, that the subgroup generated by the non-resonant roots is going to generate all of G just because some counting. So maybe let me outline the say a little bit about the, the proof of theorem one here. So ideas and the proof of theorem one. And of course, theorem one's a fancy theorem, but it's not what we actually prove. So we actually prove the following theorem, which I think I'm up to four. So B, David, and Sebastian. So I'll say it as follows. So every 
action of gamma by, and actually, well, we can reduce the, the regularity, I'll just say it for C infinity, by C infinity diffeomorphisms of M as in conjecture one has some property I will call sub-exponential growth. And let me formulate what this is. So for all epsilon positive, there exists some constant C, which probably goes to infinity as epsilon goes to zero, such that for all gamma in gamma and X in M, if you look at the derivative at X of alpha of gamma, and you take its norm, so fix some background norm, look at the soup over X, that this should be growing sub-exponentially. So this is bounded above by C e to the epsilon, oops, e to the epsilon, and now I'll say L of gamma, and what is L? This is the word length. So the, the, this is a finitely generated group, fix some finite generating set, measure the word length, and the norm of these derivatives should be growing sub-exponentially in the word length. And that, that's actually our main theorem. And if you would like to derive the finiteness from that, there's, there's not a whole lot to do, so I'll, I'll write down a handful of words. So, here's a fact. So, uh, gamma has what's called strong T, and this is not due to us, this is due to Lafork, who formulated it, and then sort of the version we need in the non-uniform version is due to de La Salle. And I won't tell you what strong T is, but a corollary is that, so strong T, this is a capital T, plus, plus this property here, which maybe I'll just call star, this is going to imply that the image of gamma sits inside of some isometry group for some reasonable Riemannian metric G. Of course, isometry groups of compact manifolds are compact, so now we have a representation to a compact group. And so Margulis is going to say that alpha of gamma is finite just by doing super rigidity with compact codomains, the, the, the dimension count is going to force this to be finite. So really the right theorem over here, the right, the right conjecture is that I've broken it. Oh, <laughs> it, it, the right conjecture here is that, um, not that it's finite, but it's isometric. And then you get the finiteness for free by asking Margulis. I'm supposed to wave here. Okay, so now I still have six minutes. So with my six minutes, I'll try to say a little bit about how we prove theorem four, and I won't actually say anything except that what we actually, I'll just reformulate it into what we actually show and, and why, that, why that's gonna give some, give some, give some contradiction. So, idea of not even the proof, so maybe reformulation. Of theorem, what was it called? Theorem four. And so this reformulation is relatively soft with some a lot of ideas in the case of co-compact lattices and then in the case of non-uniform lattices you really have to work a lot harder so it's the following so if this property fails then there exists so this property of the monodromy or of this discrete action fails then there exists an a invariant measure a invariant probability mu on this bundle X such that, well, one, one of these fiber-wise the open F exponents is non-zero for some exponent. So the fact that I don't see 
sub -exponent the, the sub-exponential growth here fails is saying when I go to the bundle and suspend this, I'm going to see a measure that sees some exponential growth in the fiber. And then two, where we really have to work is to make sure that mu projects to the Haar measure on g mod gamma, where maybe this is pi, and pi is the map from x to g mod gamma. Let me just say out loud that sort of getting an invariant measure with a non-zero exponent, that's relatively soft, particularly in the case of gamma co-compact. Getting property one is pretty soft. But getting property two, for this to have the nice projection, we actually have to work a little bit. And let me, well, let me just say what we do. So if we have x and we have mu here, and we look to g mod gamma, and maybe the projections are called mu hat, maybe here we have some a invariant measure with property one, but we don't yet have property two. So what do we do? Well, we sort of smear it along unipotence average along unipotence. So just like you can take the unipotent average of a point, you can equidistribute a point, you can equidistribute a whole measure. And while we know what happens down here when you equidistribute points and when you equidistribute measures or smear them around, average them around by, by, by unipotence. And so maybe we get another measure here, mu1, g mod gamma to mu1 hat. And maybe mu1 hat isn't the harm measure yet, but we do this a few more times, and hopefully at the end, we end up with some maybe mu infinity, some nice measure here that projects to the Haar measure. And of course, this is to get property two, but you want to make sure that property one persists while you're doing this averaging, so there's, you have to be careful there. But somehow in this averaging procedure, we're, usually, we're really using the, the first theorem I stated of Ratner a bunch of times just to keep control, just to get, just to keep that this, this measure down here eventually accumulates on the Haar measure. We are actually quoting her, her theorem somewhere in this process. So I think I have two minutes left. So maybe with two minutes, I'd like to wave my hands at theorem two. So this will be not at all convincing, but at least convince you that it's, that it, that it's conceivable. So what do we want? We're gonna, we want some, we have some, some, some action of gamma on some manifold. It's not a finite action. Then somehow I wanna show that M is RPN or SN, or RPN minus one or SN minus one, and that this is actually the, this action. And just hopefully to convince you that there's something at least looking like the action hiding in there. So idea of theorem two is so, well, since alpha is not finite, so running the same machinery that we do on our work on Zimmer's conjecture, there exists an A invariant probability called mu on this bundle X such that uh, uh, mu projects the Haar measure and there's some non-zero exponent. Um, this measure can't be G invariant because then Zimmer says that all the exponents have to be zero. So mu is not G invariant because Zimmer would say all the exponents have to be zero just by the dimension count. So what has to happen? So what has to happen is that the stabilizer of mu has to be the group, which I'll call Q, which is the group of matrices star and zeros here. So if you just work it out just by the dimension counting, this is what the stabilized set measure has to be. It can't be any bigger, it can't be any smaller. And moreover, so there's, there's n minus one placeholders here. So there's n minus one roots. There's n minus one missing roots. So this is, I'll, I'll call them beta. So this is what, the, the jth row in the first column. And there has to be n minus one fiber 
exponents, which are lambda j f, right? Because we're assuming that our dimension is is n minus one, and if the stabilizer can't be any bigger than that, then all these guys have to be resonant. So they all have to be positive proportional. So lambda j f has to be some positive multiple of the beta i j, or the beta, what was it called, beta j1. So there are these homogeneous exponential growth rates, and whatever's happening in the fiber has to be positively proportional to what's happening down here. Okay, well, this is actually telling us quite a lot, but you do need, do need to do some work, and I'll just write down some words. So we'll do some work, and so in particular what we'll do is, is non-uniform measure rigidity. There's too many IDs there. Rigidity will show that the, the C's actually have to be one, that they're not just positively proportional, but they're the same. And that, well, locally, so there's, there's some other group, which I'll call V, is this group, which is the one that's, that's transverse to this. So this is the one that's one stars here. One, zero, one, zero here. So this is the group that's spanned by, by these guys. And so locally, so mu sits on so graphs of smooth functions from V orbits to M. So if I look inside of my whole space, here's some cartoon. So my fiber looks like this. Here's my Q orbit, and here's my V orbit. And if I look at what my, what my measure has to look like, particularly if I condition it on, on these VM pieces, it has to sit on some smooth injective graph here. And then, well, using these smooth injective graphs, we can build charts such that we see M as a covering space of G mod Q. And we see it as a covering space because this, because this guy sits in this bundle that has gamma as its monodromy, this this, this measure, this, this map will have to be gamma equivariant. And I'm definitely waving my hands literally and figuratively at this. But hopefully at least this fact that because this measure has to exist, because it can't be G invariant, this has to be the stabilizer, says that at least, well, what we're seeing in the fibers is at least proportional to something that's related to this group Q. And well, we can actually upgrade that to saying that there's a reason that is proportional because it actually is what's happening from Q. Okay, so I think I'm out of time and I went over, sorry. So, thank you. So this, uh, this will be as smooth as the action and if you're not SL, then you need to assume your action is extra smooth, so maybe C infinity. But if it's a C infinity action, then this is C infinity here. Uh, no. So that's a lot harder. <laughs>